Have you ever experienced the gap between the, the values you espouse or hold, the, the theology you believe, and the life you actually live? Like the life that you know you want to live in Christ, but the life that you actually live in, the, that distance, the gap between those two? I came face to face with this reality for myself last Saturday. All right. Last Saturday, it was a family day. We decided we we're going to go hiking, which is one of my favorite activities. And we're going to go hiking at a place we haven't been to in a long time, Twin Lakes. From where we're at in Myrtle Creek, it's almost a two-hour drive. And when we left, because we're going to go do one of my favorite things, and my wife loves hiking and taking pictures, my grace tank, that's what I affectionately call my ability to handle my children's bickering, um, was at 100%, right? I'm ready to go. But after a two-hour drive in a small little Jeep Cherokee with five people, three kids in the back who are fighting over, that's my elbow space. No, that's my air conditioning vent. Dad, Dad, how much longer? This is taking forever, right? By the time we got to the trailhead, grace tank, 80%, all right? We're, de- we're trending downwards, all right? So we get to the trailhead and we get out of the car and I think, okay, new set of scenery and we just look out and it's beautiful out there. Fall colors splashing everywhere all over the trail. And I think this is gonna be great for us. We're gonna be moving our bodies. It'll be a great family hike. We get about a mile in and my youngest daughter, Audra, comes up to me and she's like, dad, how much longer do we have? And I said, well, well, sister, um, you know, we're, we're one mile into a several mile hike, right? So, so you're going to have to buckle up, pull yourself together. We can do this. Grace Tank, now 60%, okay? It's trending downwards. And so we go up, we get to the lake. It's beautiful. You can see through to the bottom. We go all the way around the lake and my son comes up and he's like, dad, my legs are tired. My toes are tired. I, I want to go back to the car. You mean go back to the two hours of bickering? Uh Uh-uh, okay? Grace tank, 40%, all right? So then I had this great idea. What if I took my wife up to the summit? She's never been there before. She loves summiting places and taking pictures from up above. This would fill up her grace tank. And so I tell the kids, hey, guess what? We're gonna love mommy well today. We're gonna take her to the summit. She's never been there. And you would have thought I just told them the worst news in the world. Uh, right? And I was like, okay, grace tank 20%. I'm running on fumes at this point. So we get going up to the summit, which adds a couple extra miles onto our hike. All told, we went about five miles this day and we get halfway up to the summit. It's like a 550 foot elevation gain. And it's about another mile and a half up to the summit. And and I, uh, my daughter, my oldest daughter, Emberlyn comes to me and she's like, dad, I can't breathe. Grace tank, 0%. And I'm not, ha- I'm not proud about what I, how I responded. But in that moment, I was like, yes, Emberlyn, I'm tired too. I'm breathing heavily too. I'm 36 years old. I got a couple years on you. My body's a little bit more worn than you. If I can do this, you can do this. And I just snapped at her. And I'm not proud of that, but that's what happened in actuality. And all told over those five miles, I had to apologize to my, to my family five times for responding in anger. You see, I teach my kids, I teach my family. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And I didn't live it out. Have you ever experienced that? Like the gap between what you want to live, the values you espouse, the the theology you hold dearly, and the life you actually live. Today, we're going to be continuing our series on the Holy Spirit. We're going to be looking at how the Holy Spirit transforms us and takes that gap, takes that distance and begins to shrink it and close it by his power and his might as he transforms us to look more like Jesus and produce righteous fruit. So we're going to be looking at that transformative process in those opportunities, those spaces, those gaps of transformation where God wants to change us, okay? Okay. And we're going to be in the book of Galatians and uh, a little bit of background about Galatians, all right? Paul wrote the Galatians and I think he was in a fiery, righteous attitude when he wrote it because he, he uses some strong language. He says, Galatians, you've heard the unadulterated, beautiful, pure gospel. And you have allowed people to come in and teach you falsehoods. People who say, yeah, Jesus is nice, but don't forget circumcision. Oh yeah, uh, uh, Jesus is good and I like what he did on the cross, but you're still under the law. 
And so the, the, their, the gospel among the Galatians was beginning to get distorted. And he writes them in no uncertain terms. He uses things like, uh, phrases like, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Whoa, okay, I told you he was fiery. At one point he even says, I wish that those who have come in and disturbed you and, and taught a false gospel would just emasculate themselves. That's not my language, that's his. And so he writes in this really fiery tone because he's passionate about the gospel and that the gospel really does meet the grid of life and it can transform us even in those gaps between what we say we wanna live and how we actually live. And so we're gonna look at how the spirit transforms us. And all throughout Galatians, Paul keeps uh, attacking the idea that, that Christians are still under the law of God, the holy, righteous law of God. That's not how we attain salvation. He says it's a gospel of grace and faith in Christ alone. And so in chapter five, he talks about this transformative process. Galatians chapter five, starting in verse 16. But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Notice firstly, the spirit there is capital S spirit, not your spirit, not my spirit. This is the Holy Spirit, the, the guy we've been talking about throughout this whole series, the God, the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. And he has come and indwelt believers. We talked about this a couple of weeks back, right? The, the Holy Spirit has made you his temple. And now he's waging war and battling against your fleshly desires. This is only true of followers of Jesus. Because if they're not, if somebody is not a follower of Jesus, the temple doesn't reside in them, or sorry, the spirit doesn't reside in them. They're not a temple. And so he says, look, there's these fleshly desires in the Holy Spirit and they're waging war against each other. The, the desires of your flesh are opposed to the spirit and the desires of the spirit are opposed to the flesh. And that word in the original language for flesh, sarks, it's a weighty word, S-A-R-X. It's a weighty word. And what it means is the, the totality of what somebody is able to, or what evil somebody is able to do apart from the grace of God. That's weighty. And it says that the spirit wants to transform those fleshly desires. And so he battles and wages war against it. And Paul goes on, he says, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Again, this is a theme all throughout Galatians. He's saying, look, it's grace, not law. You're not under the law. It's not, if you were under the law, what Jesus did is, is of no value to you. You're not under the law, you're under grace. Now the works of the flesh are evident. All right, uh, fair warning. It's gonna get gnarly. It's gonna get gross. We're gonna be entering into depravity right here, right? These, this is a, a very visceral picture of the works of the flesh. Look at this sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Whoa, like I read that, I wanna take a shower. Like that just feels gross. That feels de depraved and awful. That feels evil, right? Nobody reads that list. It's like, man, that is my five-year plan. I wanna check all those boxes. No, right? we recognize the evil therein, that this is an awful thing. But these things are exactly what our flesh wants to do. That's a really sobering reality. And the spirit who dwells in us wages war against these fleshly desires. Even right now. You see this battle between the spirit and, and, and the flesh? It happens all the time. Even right now, as we hear truth, the flesh, or I'm sorry, the spirit wants to confirm and convict and challenge and encourage and comfort. As we hear truth, he wants to apply it to our life. The flesh wants to distort, wants to make excuse for sin. This battle between the spirit and the flesh is happening in you and I in this very moment. Are you aware of that battle? It's a spirit who is far more powerful than the flesh is waging war against this gnarly, gross, evil list of depraved actions. And then Paul gives them a very sober warning. Look at this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
whoa, that's sobering, right? That's, that's a weighty statement. And I want to do some work here because I want it to be clear. What it can sound like is Paul is saying, if you do this, you get the kingdom of God. If you don't do this, you don't get the kingdom of God. But that's not the gospel. The gospel isn't you do the right things and you don't do the wrong things so that you get the kingdom of God. You get to go to heaven. You get to be in relationship with God. That's not the gospel. What he's saying here is if your life is marked by these desires of the flesh, these actions of the flesh that we just walked through, and they're not decreasing and the fruit of the spirit, which we'll get to in a moment, isn't increasing, you've just revealed that you don't actually have relationship with God. And so he's, he's warning them, as I would warn us, like if these things are just increasing in our life, we should, we should soberly evaluate, am I truly in relationship with the God of the universe? Does the spirit dwell within me? Because he fights against this nonsense, this evil, this depravity. And so Paul warns them, if this is what your life looks like, you won't inherit the kingdom of God because you don't have the spirit dwelling within you. You have not been forgiven by Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying you have to do this perfectly, but it should be as we walk with the spirit, this should be an increasing process. And he continues, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. Look at those words. Doesn't that just, don't you want to be the embodiment of that in every relationship you show up into? In your marriage? What would that do for your marriage if you were the embodiment of the fruit of the Spirit there? Or your parenting? Or your interactions with your parents? Or your teachers? Or your friends? Like, what if you could show up exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit? And notice the word fruit. In the original language, it is actually in the singular. It's not fruits of the Spirit. There's one fruit. It's multifaceted. It's not like we get to pick and choose which fruit we like. I like the strawberry. I want the blueberry. I want a banana. No, this is one fruit multifaceted. We don't say, yeah, I'm going to choose love, but patience. Uh Uh-uh. No, it's one fruit that the Spirit wants to develop within you that's multifaceted. What would it be like for your life if you showed up this way everywhere? Increasingly in your relationships. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, which is passions and desires. And so he says, look, there's ultimate victory in Jesus because Jesus on the cross died in our place. He took our sin upon himself, crucifying the flesh, those gnarly, gross, evil, depraved desires we just walked through. He's crucified that. And because of his victory, now we can walk in the freedom and exhibit these fruits increasingly in our lives. Verse 25, this is where we'll kind of land the plane as far as where we're going in, this, in the passage today. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And so he says, if we live by the Spirit, that, that idea that we talked about a few weeks ago, where, that we're indwelt by the Spirit, and he empowers us to live this life gospel-centered and Jesus-focused. If we live by the Spirit, then we are to keep in step with him. There's an intentional choice to keep in step with the Spirit. Here's where we're going today. The primary thing I want us to focus in on is that He produces fruit. He, the Holy Spirit, remember, the Spirit isn't some impersonal force. He's a person, and He is God, and He's the one who produces the fruit. It's not me. It's not you. We can't muster up fruit in our lives. It's not like if I look at my life and I just realize, man, I'm not being loving that I can try really hard to muster up love. I don't have agape within me. Agape, unconditional love, that comes from God. And so I need the spirit of God within me to transform me. If I try and drum it up by myself, that's fear-based behavior modification. And what the spirit does, he transforms us by love-rooted transformation. Let's look at it again in the passage. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of the believer, not the fruit of the follower of Jesus, not the fruit of the saint. It's, it's the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit's the one that produces this. Just like an apple tree has everything within it to produce and nourish the fruit of an apple. 
So the Spirit has everything within Him to transform and empower us to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. This is not some legalistic checklist that we have to grow in by ourselves. We are empowered and transformed to exhibit these fruits by the Spirit because He is the one who transforms us. He transforms us. We don't transform ourselves. And this is a process. When we talk about exhibiting the fruit or, uh, or growing in spiritual maturity, a big word for that that theologians use is sanctification. When we talk about growing in spiritual maturity, it's a direction. It's not a destination. It's not as though you arrive at one point and you just kind of coast on your laurels until the end. That's not reality. It's transformation throughout the entirety of your life until glorification at the end of it. That's all of it. And so he does the transformative work within you and I. But it's so easy to read this list and as Christians to to want to make it a to-do list. And at Family Church, we have uh, something we call the spiritual pathway. And it kind of explains this idea that spiritual maturity or bearing fruit is a direction. It's not a destination. And it begins with a seeker. Seeker is somebody who does not know God. And all they need is Jesus. They need Jesus badly, just like you and I need Jesus. And when they come to that moment of repentance and faith in Jesus, they become what we call a student. And a student is, is kind of a baby Christian. They're learning about God. They're, they're uh, learning how to read their Bibles, what it means to pray. But they're also still very self-centered. And so as a student surrenders, and that's what these bridges are. Ultimately, at the deepest part, these arrows between the, the, uh, the postures here it's surrender. It's trust. It's continuing to abide in Christ. As they surrender, they would grow into what we call a servant. This is somebody who's very we-focused. They see others. They see others' needs. These are people who are very excited about the community of the church and often are very active within it. And as they go through a process of deeper surrender, sometimes this is going through weighty trials that God brings them through. They ultimately become a steward where where they become more God-focused. And this is a process that we go through in all areas of our life. And though this pathway ends, spiritual maturity does not. Spiritual maturity is a direction, not a destination. It's a part of our journey for the whole of our lives. So what really does this look like? I know when I first became a Christian, I thought, well, Jesus is going to fix all my bad stuff. And Jesus does transform. The gospel really does meet the grid of life. I mean, that that moment on the trail, God wants to transform that in me and he has the power to do so. But what does this actually practically look like in the life of a believer? Here's a quote from Jen Wilkin that I think is really, really helpful for some practical things to kind of look for as we're evaluating our own fruit. She says, sanctification, which if you don't know who Jen Wilkin is, she's a preacher. And she says, sanctification rarely looks like an immediate ceasing of a particular sin. That's what I thought when I first became a Christian, like Jesus fix it. It more often looks like an increase in the distance between repeated sins and a decrease in the distance between committing them and confessing them. That's such a robust definition. But she says that it's, there's an increase in the distance between repetition of sin. So this is increasing throughout our life, not perfectly, but increasingly. And then when we do fail, when we do sin, that there's a decrease in the gap between committing the sin and confessing it. This is evidence of sanctification. This is evidence of spiritual maturity. This is evidence of the fruit of the Spirit beginning to develop in your life. And so as we walk through all of those words that that kind of... uh, Paul uses to describe the fruit of the Spirit, I want to walk back through those and explain each of them. And here's why. Because probably if we asked everybody in the room uh, what love means, we're going to get a lot of different definitions. And so I've walked through each of these uh, uh, ways that Paul describes the fruit of the Spirit, and I've kind of addressed what each of them means from what I see in the Bible. All right, so here's how I did this. I went to the original word in the original language and looked at how it shows up in the New Testament to try and derive a kind of definition for that word. So we're gonna walk through these. I'm gonna try to do it slow enough where you can actually take notes. Um, This is a moment where you're gonna put on your thinking cap, okay? Um, Maybe some of you haven't heard that since like elementary school, but this is gonna be a moment where we're gonna, it might be a little heady, but these are really important terms to walk through, okay? So the first one, the fruit of the spirit, love. 
love. And the word there is agape. If you've been around the church, um, agape is God's unconditional love, right? And it says, uh, from the fruit of the spirit perspective, love is a deep-seated, unconditional affection. Deep-seated, unconditional affection. And so when you see that word affection, you might think, you know, smooching your wife or, or when you see your parents smooching, but that's not what I mean, okay? Um, there's a difference between affection and feeling. Affection is a word that theologians use. It is deep-rooted. It has to do with your mind, your will, your emotions, whereas feeling is often fairly shallow, uh, fleeting, and it has to do with simply just your emotions. And so the idea of, a, of love is a deep-seated, unconditional affection, before or in the fruit of the spirit. The second one is joy. Joy is a a good feeling in the soul. Joy is often conflated with happiness, right? They're often used synonymously, but they're not the same thing. Joy is a good feeling in the soul rooted in gospel hope. Happiness is a good feeling rooted in circumstance, right? When things are going well and everything's going my way, I'm happy. There's nothing wrong with that. But joy remains despite circumstance because it's not rooted in what's going on in your life. It's rooted in gospel hope, all right? And we see this good feeling in the New Testament where they say, receive each other with hope there's a, or with joy. There's this, there's this idea of, of uh, excitement and a good feeling deep within, okay? The next one, peace, tranquility, despite circumstance, tranquility despite circumstance. Often people think of peace as, man, I can only have peace when I'm on the beach in a chair and I have a coconut water in my hand and the waves are just kind of lapping up on the shore and it's beautiful out. This kind of peace that Paul's talking about here is the peace of God, which surpasses understanding. It's the peace of God that when people look at your life and they think, man, you should be at war right now. How are you tranquil? How do you have peace in the midst of these circumstances because God's peace, the peace of God is tranquility despite circumstance. Circumstance doesn't impact the internal state of peace. The next one is patience. Patience is a quiet endurance, especially under trials. A quiet endurance, especially under trials. It is not patience if you grumble all the way, okay? My hike with my children was not patient. I was not being patient because I was grumbling about their attitudes, Okay, but when we, when we say quiet, we don't mean hidden. We don't mean if you're really struggling that you don't share this with somebody as you're enduring trials. That's not what we mean. What we mean is that you are not living uh, uh, patiently grumbling. That's not patience. So it's a quiet endurance, especially under trials. The next one, kindness, a gracious orientation of the heart towards another. This, is, this is a, has everything to do with how we show up in relationship. A gracious orientation of the heart towards another. And so the kindness and goodness are often confused where kindness is how we show up in our relationships. Goodness is actually uh, has to do with the posture of your heart within you. Moral uprightness of the heart. Or in other spaces, it's, it's uh, uh, synonyms rather for the original word is moral excellence. So moral uprightness of the heart. The next one, faithfulness, promise keeping rooted in promise receiving. That as I've received promises from God in the gospel of love, acceptance, uh, 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 grace, forgiveness, as I receive those promises, I can now show up in my relationships with you and others as a promise keeping faithful person. So promise keeping rooted in promise receiving. Next one, gentleness. Gentleness is a humble disposition. This is, again, how you show up in relationships. Pride is the opposite of this. Gentleness isn't just not going around clocking everybody. It's humbly presenting yourself in relationship to others. And lastly, self-control. Self-control is a mastery of one's appetites and emotions. And when I say appetites, I don't mean just not double fisting burritos at Taco Bell, okay? It's your appetites, the vices, maybe even some of those fleshly desires that you have. It's mastering those, bringing them under control and in your life and your emotions. That self-control has everything to do with your emotions and how you show up in relationships. That when I'm angry, can I still present myself in an honoring way in that conflict and love the person well in the midst of it? So this is the fruit of the spirit. But the problem is often when we, when we see this list, we want to just start a checklist and, and, and make a legalistic 
to-do list. And that's, that's not what Paul's intention is here because the spirit is the one that transforms us, but we are not just passive participants in this process. So what's our role? If he transforms us, our role is we trust. We trust him. We trust the Holy Spirit. Look at the language in Galatians 5. This is kind of a smattering of verses here, but he says, Galatians 5, 16. I say, walk by the Spirit. But if you are led by the Spirit, Galatians 5, 18. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Galatians 5, 25. These are intentional trust actions. All of these require trust. I don't have to walk with the Spirit. I could go this way. I don't have to let the Spirit lead me. I could go that way. But if I'm trusting Him, I'm going to submit, surrender, and follow Him. I'm going to abide with Him. And, and so the idea is we don't drum this stuff up within ourselves. We grow in trusting Him. Paul clarifies this a little bit earlier in Galatians. Look at Galatians 3. Two to three. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by faith, by works of the law or by hearing with, what's the word? Faith. <laughs> he says, did you receive this spirit by works of the law? Like you just got so righteous that the spirit was like, hey, that looks like a good place to dwell. No, you heard the gospel, repented of your sin, placed your faith in Jesus. And now the spirit came to you. You received the spirit by faith, by trust. Okay, now watch his logic. Are you so foolish? I love, he's fiery. He's a fiery preacher. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? He says, look, you started in trust. You started in faith. Now you're going to try and perfect yourself in the flesh by works of the law. That's not the gospel. You began receiving the Spirit by faith and you continue your encounter with the Spirit by faith. It's all about trusting Him, which we don't like that because it means we, are, we don't have to go do something to make these fruits happen. We simply abide. We surrender. We trust. So how do we grow in trust, right? Probably everybody would say, yeah, I trust God. If I asked around the room, probably everybody would say, yeah, I trust God. But does that, again, that, that belief show up in your life? Several years ago, uh, my little boy uh, was a toddler and he's a little barbarian. He's not afraid of anything. He just, ah, you know, he's climbing trees like Tarzan and, and uh, he's freaking me out. And uh, there was one thing that he was afraid of. It was a blue dirt devil. All right, we had one of those like 1970s uh, vacuum cleaners. It sounds like a jet engine's going off when you turn it on. And he was mortified of this thing. So one day I sat him down on the couch and said, okay, buddy, we're going to talk. All right, um, I'm going to vacuum the living room for mommy. And what I want you to know is you're going to be okay. And so I asked him a line of questioning. I said, do you trust daddy? Do you trust me? Yes. Okay, good. Does daddy want to hurt you? No. Okay. Would daddy let anything bad happen to you intentionally? No. Okay. Daddy's going to use the vacuum. Do you trust that I, I will protect you, that the vacuum is not going to get you? Yes, he trusts me. Okay, so I go over to the vacuum. I turn that baby on, jet engines roaring, right? And he ran out of that room like the kid from Home Alone, ah, you know, just screaming and back into his bedroom. Big alligator tears coming down his face. Why? He said he trusted me. It didn't show up in his life. And I think far too often we can proclaim trust in God, but it might not actually show up in our life. So how do we actually grow in trust? If, if my part of the transformational journey is trusting the Lord, how do we grow in trust? It's a very helpful tool. At least I've found it very helpful. It's on the back of your outline um, called Fruit to Root. And it looks like this. And this is a process where you are growing in trusting the Lord by finding the lies you're believing, uprooting those, and deeply rooting in yourself, yourself in, in the truth, embracing that, and thereby trusting God. So here's what this process looks like. Feel free to take notes along the way on the back of your outline. But you start over here on this left-hand side, the tree, all right? It says the confession of sin. This is a lot of that fleshly fruit that we talked about earlier, right? And so if you were to examine your life, what's the fruit of your life? Are you anxious, fearful, angry, frustrated? Do you desire control? And as you evaluate the fruit of your life, you can ask a series of questions to get down to the root lie that's fueling that behavior. Let's take the idea of desire for control. So when I desire control, the first question here, who do I think I am? Well, I think 
I'm not in control, but I need to be. I need to be in control. All right, now we move to a deeper question. What do I think God has done? When I'm experiencing this fruit, what do I think God has done? Well, if I'm experiencing the fruit that, that I desire control, and I think I need to be in control, but I, I can't be, then I really believe God has lost control. He's absent. He's lost control. Let me go to the deeper question. As a result of that fruit and my answers to the two previous questions, who do I think God is in this moment? Well, I really think if, if I desire control, I really think that he's impotent and he's absent. Now, no one walks around when they're desiring control and saying, man, I think God's impotent and absent. But can you see how that lie fuels that fruit in your life? You're believing a lie. You're not trusting the truth of God and it fuels bad fruit, fleshly fruit. So that gets down to the core root of the, the behavior, which is a lie. And then you walk through a repentance moment on the other side over here confession of faith. Though I feel these things or I'm experiencing these lies right now and this fruit, what do I know to be true? Who is God according to scripture? Well, God's not absent and impotent. He's almighty and he's ever present. Second question, what has God done to show that to me? Well, he created everything, but awesome, but more awesome than that, he overcame my three greatest enemies, sin, Satan, and the grave. That's mighty power. And he's given me his spirit to dwell within me. That's presence within my life. He's not absent and impotent. He's mighty in power and present. And a result of those truths, who am I? Well, I am under the care of the sovereign God of the universe. And as I reflect on those truths, what fruit goes in those bubbles at the top of the tree? Love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. And so this is a helpful process. If our job in the transformative journey is to trust God, this is a helpful tool. And I hope it'll become a regular thing that you come back to and say, I'm, not, I'm believing lies. I want to grow and trust in God. I'm going to embrace the truth of God through this process as he transforms and we trust I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys. Have a good day. All right. Thank you guys so much for sticking around and, and digging into God's word in Galatians about the fruit of the spirit and how God transforms us. And today we want to continue to put before us this missional rhythm that we call the bless rhythm, where we're living in connection to the spirit, listening to him on mission, where we live, work, and play. And so I just want to unpack this briefly. And we have a really a focus on one of these aspects today. So Blessed rhythm begins with prayer. It's the first one, the B, is begin in prayer. Every day as you wake up in the morning, God, where are you working around me? And, and how can I join you in that? Who are you calling me to love or serve? or what? Where are you working, Lord? And help me to see that and join you. The second one, listen, is where you're, you're listening to others, listening to their story. What gospel do they believe in? Many people believe in lots of gospels, just most of them don't have Jesus in them. So, so what are they believing? And building relationship by listening. Often Christians come into these uh, opportunities for sharing the gospel with all kinds of answers. And we might be answering questions they don't, they're not even asking. And so listening to the deep heart, asking good questions of the, of the individual you're with. And then eating. I love that one, right? Eating, sitting together over a meal, inviting them into your home, eating together, it's so relational. And so eat together, invite them into your life unabashed. The next one is serving, that you find ways that you can meaningfully serve them in, in ways that mean something to that individual. And the last one, the one I want to really focus in on is to share, right? The share the gospel, yes. But as we talk about the fruit of the spirit today, the idea of share here is not just pepper them with, a gospel presentation, but share the transformative work that the Lord has done in your life as you show up in that relationship, exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit and show them and uh, not just tell them, but show them how God has transformed you. So this is the bless rhythm. And it's a, a very powerful tool of missional living on a daily basis. We want to challenge you to begin living this out. If you have already been living this out, man, let us know how God is using you in your sphere of influence. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the truth 
that you sent Jesus to die for our sins in our place and we get to be righteous because of our faith in him. And Jesus, thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit, the helper, the comforter, our intercessor. I pray that we would be um, fully aware of what the Spirit says to us daily as we attempt to live out this blessed rhythm and join you in what you're doing in the world. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again so much for joining us, guys. Love you.